Um, yeah, like she said, we've been growing mushrooms since 2003. And, um, you know, from the very get-go, um, the whole story was substrate acquisition. So those are my two key words for you all today. Substrate. For the mushroom grower, that is the most important thing. It's what I worry about at night. So I lay awake, sleepless at night, is finding the substrate to grow my mushrooms on. In 2003, we started growing on straw. And then we, you know, then we couldn't find good straw. So then we went with the wood, and we started growing on wood, and that worked okay. But in 2011, I started working with these um, investor folks from Colorado who said, we want to grow mushrooms on Colorado substrate, and we're going to send you some substrates to trial. Would you trial them for us? And so they started sending sunflower shells waste from Urca Grain in Fort Morgan. They started sending the shell waste to us, and we started trialing it. And um, well, it was just almost like a miraculous thing. I mean, I felt like I'm actually, when that happened, I felt like, uh, you know, the sunflowers were like the best. <laughs> they were like, this is really like my life is going, just turning around here. Um, and because organisms that weren't growing very well for us were growing on 100% sunflower shell. I mean, it was just really, I mean, this is stuff's been in the literature kind of here and there, but um, generally mushroom growers grow mushrooms on wood. And so, Everything was going fine. The Colorado investors got bored and they backed out. And we just kept buying shell from Fort Morgan, from Urca Grains. And that went okay for a while. We started, you know, with 50 pound bags, turned into 500 pound totes. And then, you know, we had to buy 12 of them at a time to get the shipping rate. And everything was going pretty good. And then, you know, it's just uh, the next word I have for you that you need to remember is change. So substrate, <laughs> substrate acquisition. And then the next important word is change because nothing ever stays the same. And so, because I don't own this mill, you know, like I don't know, you know, like I don't know what's, you know, they, every, every batch was different, you know. And then um, some of it was a different kind of sunflower. Some of it was just really um, 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 dusty. And then they would just say, oh, well, um, we don't, we're not even shelling it now. We're not even milling it now because we're sending it all um, whole to our customers and not even milling it. And so it was just always something. And so um, by that time, the, um, I was, it was too late because I was already hooked um, on the sunflower and um, I just really couldn't get enough. I was like, well, what am I going to do? You know, oh, Luckily, I live in Kansas, the sunflower state. And so um, I thought, well, maybe I can uh, find some sunflower growers in Kansas. Well, they all live out in western Kansas. And then the mills out there, you know, they didn't want to talk to me at all. And so what any self-respecting farmer would do next would be, I'm just going to do it myself. We'll just grow it ourselves. So um, my um, mushroom, the guy that helps me, Connor, um, we got together and we thought through. And we thought, well, why don't we just apply for a SARE grant? And um, we had three questions we wanted to answer by getting the SARE grant. Was that, could we grow our own substrate economically? Could we grow our own substrate and have it yield as well as what we've been using? And then the third question was, could we find a crop that we could sell for food to a human and then have a waste that so the farmer could get double sales. They could sell their crop to, for human consumption and have this waste that I would guarantee them that I would pay them you know, whatever price we agreed upon. And um, so the answers to those three questions are yes, yes, and maybe. Um, <laughs> so um, here's a picture of our sign. Next, that's our, um, that's my main mushroom facility. And over here on the, on the right is my hoop house. That's a government funded hoop house, the uh, federal um, pl um, plan that they give you hoop houses. But I never, grow, I never grew vegetables or plants in there. It's a substrate hoop house now. It's where I dry all my substrate. Uh, the next building over here is my autoclave room. This is a, a grow room right here. And it's attached to this greenhouse right here. So um, if you know anything about mushrooms, mushrooms use oxygen and give off CO2. So my mushroom room is exhausting into my um, greenhouse all winter, so I'm pumping 60 degree CO2 rich moist air into this greenhouse all year. So it's really, I mean, that's a great thing for my plants. Oh, and then um, you'll see in the front here, here's my compost pile. So all the substrate ends up in the compost pile eventually. And there's what we plant the sunflower with. We bought this. We didn't have this the first year, but we, um, we, had, we bought this for the second year. Um, for the grant, we decided to, to focus on two plants, and that would be corn and sunflower. And so um, this is a three-person grant, 
and um, I was the mushroom grower, Connor is going to be the corn grower, and this other guy was going to be the sunflower grower. Well, right away, the sunflower grower said, I'm just not going to grow them. Well, he actually didn't tell me. He just, I had to call him. <laughs> I thought you want to be reimbursed for the seed. Oh, I just didn't grow it. And so um, um, this was June. So I just decided, once again, I guess I'll just have to grow them myself. And so um, what was a bad situation turned out to be really the best thing that ever happened to me because I got to learn about the sunflower plant like I never would have if I had had someone else growing it for me. And so I discovered some, some really important things. Um, but anyway, the first year, we, um, Connor grew three acres of corn. I ended up growing six-tenths of an acre of sunflower. I mean, it was already June. You know, I just put it in by hand. Um, but right from the get-go, I discovered that um, the sunflower was easier to grow. It sprouts better um, compared, compared to corn. Um, it needs less fertility. It can buy, get by with less water. Um, it out, um, I would really put my sunflower against any weed out there. I mean, it can outgrow any, any weed. Just name one. <laughs> it was just amazing. I mean, I just I couldn't believe it. Um, and um, so the corn was suffering. From, and the other main thing is that, you know, when you plant corn, the main one, number one problem with the corn planting was not having the right wheel, the right seed plate for the right corn. Because I don't know if you have grown corn, but if you get the corn too close together, it doesn't make corn. And so this corn that first year was too close together a lot of times. And so that, and that's our main number one problem. You think it would be easily solved, but I mean, that's Connor's doing the corn, I'm doing the sunflower, so <laughs> I'm focusing, focusing on the sunflower. Um, so um, sunflower um, just had many advantages. Um, I also discovered that first year that as a sunflower head was maturing, I brought some heads here, dried heads. Um, as a sunflower, these are really super dry, but in June when they're um, uh, green and they're maturing, then there's a point when the shell and the, the plant is mature, the leaves have dropped off, but, and it's perfectly usable for my mushrooms, but it's the kernel inside isn't completely formed. So in my mind, I'm thinking, I gotta mill the sunflower. How, what, how am I gonna mill it? Because the sunflower guy, he also, the sunflower grower also had a mill. So we're losing his mill and we're losing his sunflower growing. So I'm, I'm buying shell from Colorado, it's milled. How am I gonna get it milled? So um, that is one alternative. It's like just pick it before the kernels mature. Um, of course, I can't. You, you know, at some point we couldn't keep up with it all, and eventually it dries like that. But um, the some the, the corn varieties that Connor used that first year was a um, a seed from an organic seed from Welter Seeds. It was a drought resistant, just a field corn. Um, it grew pretty well. It produced quite a bit of corn. But that third question, you know, can you get a food item out of this? Well, a field corn, we made cornmeal with it, we made some masa with it, but it's field corn, you know, it's not milling corn. So it was, you know, the same thing. It, was, it gave us what we want, lots of cob, but it, it didn't give us, the, you know, just a, a really inferior uh, kernel. The other, the other uh, plant, the other seed that he uh, grew for corn was a uh, bloody butcher which is, is a milling corn, and it's a corn, I don't know if you're familiar with it, it's a red corn, it grows 10 to 12 feet tall. It has the advantage that um, wildlife can't get up to the ears because they're practically like at eye height. And um, it's pretty vigorous. Connor can keep the seed, um, raises the seed, it's open pollinated. Um, we were happy with that. The seed that I used for sunflower was um, Royal Hybrid 1121, and it's from Johnny's Selected Seeds. Um, you know, I just can't say enough good things about this variety. It's just like, you know, it's, um, it's a single stem. It grows seven feet tall. It makes eight inch heads. It's super vigorous. It's fast. Um, and so I was really happy with that. That first year, we, um, we only had the six tenths of, of uh, sunflower. So I didn't really have a lot of products. So I wanted to get every last bit of, uh, of a shell off the heads. So we basically just scraped the, um, the shells off. You could either scrape them off, or as um, my employee Michael, he just started growing on dirt and stuff like that, you know. They're, they're terribly brittle, so you could just practically step on them. Or as I, um, you know, maybe the next thing would be get some kind of a lawn roller or something to smash them, you know, that way. So we, we literally just um, extracted every bit, little, every bit of shell we could, and um, 
I'll just kind of give you a brief uh, anatomy of the sunflower head. I'm no botan botanist, but um, you know, as far as I can tell, the sunflower head has got four parts, and that's the backing, and then you've got this, this hole right here that's stuck to the backing, and then you've got the shell. Every shell is stuck in this little hole inside these holes, and of course you've got the kernel inside the shell. So in my mind, I don't want the kernel. You know, mushrooms don't grow on high oil, high fat. And the backing looks like styrofoam. You know, what you want is a substrate that grabs water but doesn't, that lets it go too and drains it. So and the, the, um, the hole is kind of a silicone-y type of material. I figured it would probably be okay. We're just scraping it off. It's coming along for the ride. So the very first year we scraped this off, and I, the, the yields for this 1121 are listed at um, 1,800 pounds per acre, but half of that's kernel and half of that's shell. So with me scraping off all that extra hole, and then I weighed it and extrapolated it out what it would be per acre, I got 40% more weight just by bringing the hole along with the shell. So already I was getting a higher yield, so I was happy with that. Um, that was the first year. Um, the second year we went from six tenths of an acre to four acres of sunflowers. So I, um, you might be asking, well, how did you get those sunflower heads off of the plant? Well, you just take a clippers and go out and cut them. <laughs> um, I mean, I was told that if I was going to use a combine, it would take a half an acre just to fill the combine up. So if I'm combining two acres, <laughs> I mean, it's just, you know, it's all scale, a matter of scale. And so, um, but we, I, huh? What's that? The kernels? Yeah. Oh, well, I'm just, I'm just going ahead and using them. You're just leaving them in there. Uh, yeah, because I, I mean, when I get the shell from Urker, from the mill, it's about 25% uh, sh kernel anyway. Yeah. And, um, and there's really just like it's a, a matter of necessity. I just can't really, I mean, I just have to try something first and see if it works. And then if it doesn't work, go on. Right. But yeah, you could, you could take this, this shell and then put it through a chipper shredder and break it like a mill, and then soak it in water, and then the kernel drops. And after about an hour, you can just skim off all the shell, and all the kernel goes to the bottom. Then you can just dump that water out, and it's like, you know, for every 40-gallon um, tub, there was like um, a half a gallon of kernel in there, you know. So it's good chicken food, right. and the, the and birds like it. But I just left them in. That first year, we just scraped and used them. The second year, I got four acres of them. Still the cutting, the harvesting isn't too bad really. And we, I really, I figured on four acres of, of uh, sunflower, we spent on the average of five hours a week cutting them down. And that was over the course of four months. And it's really a very advantageous job. Uh, people, I mean, if you know anything about vegetable farming, most vegetables are on the ground. So this is like <laughs> seven feet tall, you're not stooping. You know, just drive your truck out there, turn the radio on, and start filling tubs of, of sunflowers. So you don't use the stalks? No, but I brought some because I'm thinking about it. But um, that's another matter. <laughs> um, so that second year, um, I, I'm going, what are we going to do? Take, scrape all this shell off of four acres worth of stuff. And so in the back of my mind, I'm always thinking, you know, I'd just like to take these heads and just send them right through my chipper shredder, you know, and, um, and then, you know, see what happens. So, um, so that's what I did. So the second year we trialed and um, I actually broke the shell off just like this, pounded it off, and that was one farm shell. Then there was farm shell pounded and farm shell chipped. So I'm trying to see, you know, trying to, um, you know, get rid of the back of the head to see if that's a problem, you know. Will the farm shell pounded work better than the chipped? So, um, but I think that, you know, if you're, gonna, if you're going, say, an 1,800 pounds per acre and you just use the whole head, I think you've doubled your weight. So that 1,800 pounds per acre, I think, be using the whole head, I'm probably up to at least 3,000 an acre. Um, and then you're measuring the uh, yield of mushrooms from the, from the substrate? Is you're measuring the yield of the mushrooms? Yeah, so that's the trials. Yeah, yeah. So that's on your page here, you can look on the bottom of that page there, you can see we did four organisms. So for the trial part, I wanted to, um, I know how much variation there is in producing mushrooms. I mean, if you just have some bad spawn or the fruiting room isn't right or the substrate isn't right or maybe the sterilization process wasn't good, you've got to keep everything constant to really be able to measure something and compare. So um, this, the whole trial took me a little bit longer because I wanted to 
take each organism through the process all the same time and then hold all the parameters constant except one thing and that was the, what substrate it was. And so we held, you know, the, organ the constants were it was the same organism, they all used the same spawn, the same spawn type, um, they all went through the sterilizer at the same time, um, they all used the same amount of spawn in each bag, and then they all were ran together through the incubation room and in, put into the fruiting room at the same time so I could eliminate any kind of like, well, this produced better because, or for some other reason, you know, so I tried to hold all the constants the same. Uh, we could just go right to those uh, results if you wanted to. Um, they're there on the bottom of your page, and there's four organisms. Um, each organism got six different kinds of substrate, and each type of substrate got 10 bags. So this is like a fruiting bag here. So all in all, I did 240 bags. So, um, oh, you know, we could go down this, this first one, Pohu, that was done the first year when we still had um, Urker shells. So each, each organism also had a control, which was like um, the substrate that I would normally use for that organism, just to try and give me some kind of reference, you know, of what I would get. Well, um, Pohu is your, is your first one, that's the oyster. And um, well, the Urker shell, um, it says here it made 1.7 pounds per block. I don't believe that, but I mean, <laughs> the farm shell didn't do as well. Um, so I, I was going through the grow room today and I decided, well, by golly, that Urker grain isn't going to show me up any. So I found this bag that I'm, I'm going through the grow room today and you, when I write on the bags, and I write the organism and the date. And this is a bag that's got 40% chipped farm shell in it. And it's from the seventh. It usually takes me two or three weeks to get to the fruiting point. This is 12 days. That is insane. And um, I thought I'd just rip the bag open to show you that I could get a pound off of this block too. <laughs> just like the other bag. But you can see it's just ringed with primordials. All these are going to become big mushrooms. And so this block will easily make three quarters to a pound on the first flush. So, you know, that's just a matter of, you know, the oyster really you're going to get your volume off of second and third flushes. So it's easy enough to keep track of the tin blocks when they go into the fruiting room. And then when you start doing second flushes, you've got to keep track of them. It was really difficult to keep track of each variety after they left the fruiting room and went into second flushes. So that's what I think happened here is that the Colorado shell probably was more broken down and that's why the oyster was able to utilize it better, thus making more mushrooms. Uh, organism two is shiitake. And um, um, we just had this gut feeling that corn cob was going to be a good, or, a good substrate for shiitake. And if you look on there, number one was 50% cob, 50% sawdust. It made seven t uh, three quarters of a pound per block which is pretty good. Um, it did better than the control block at number four. And, um, but then when we combined the cob and the shell down in five and six, we saw less um, production, so I'm not sure. That's another one of those things, I don't think that's right. <laughs> um, um, there's all these other variables I didn't even take into account, like when you soak the substrate, corn cob is like totally it's just like hydrophobic, you know? It's like you have to really soak it a long, long time. And so it could have been that in five and six, the cob didn't get soaked as much. There's other reasons why. But I'm pretty happy that we feel like, you know, I mean, really, 50% cob, 50% sawdust, three quarters of a pound for the first block, that's profitable. And um, sawdust is, well, if you look on the other, the other part of your page there, I could give the comparable prices of different kinds of substrates. And sawdust is costing me about eight cents a pound. So who wouldn't want to you know, mix something with something else that was a lot cheaper? Because that's really how I'm going to keep my cost down, is keep the price of the substrate down. What kind of sawdust? Um, well, it's sawdust. What's that? What kind of sawdust? What kind of sawdust? Well, I have a little container right over there. It's sawdust that is the biggest particle size sawdust or the smallest wood chip that you could find. So it's got to be like, it looks like very, very small wood chips or very big sawdust. So it can't be fine. It's got to, all substrate is about this. It's got to have fluff. You know, it's got to be able to grab the water, let the water out, and then not be soggy, you know. So you don't want something that's just going to mash down and all the oxygen gets pushed out. So it's very special. I worked hard and long and hard. It comes from near Springfield, Missouri. I have to buy 21 tons at a time. 
It showed up a month ago in the middle of the night. <laughs> and I found out because he came knocking on the door saying he was stuck. <laughs> That's a whole other story. <clears throat> anyway, we're pretty happy with the shiitake um, uh, farm shell chipped, which is what I'm, you know, sending just whole heads right through the chipper shredder. Um, which is what I'm really like. I'm rooting for anything on this sheet. It's I'm rooting for farm shell chip because that's cheap for me to make. It's easy to run through the chipper shredder. So that's what I'm rooting for. So I mean that did very well. Shiitake farm shell chip did a whole pound per block. So I'm happy there. Uh, these last two organisms, black poplar and heresium, I mean they're the ones that we couldn't really get good yields on wood. And when we found, got the sunflower shell, they were growing, doubling their production on straight sunflower shell. So um, that's why I really wanted to check these two out. And, um, and I think that the farm shell chip did real well. Um, it did better than the cob on black poplar. And uh, did better than the control. And here on black poplar, both the, the cob farm shell combo did better. Um, and the heresium was the same. I thought uh, farm shell chip did pretty well there. It was one of the highest ones. So as for these two, black poplar and heresium, they're more oddball varieties that don't produce well to begin with, and um, even six tenths of a pound per block is a good, good yield. So my strategy now for planting sunflowers on four acres is that, um, well, what happened is that between year one and two, I'm in my, my substrate hoop house, and I'm noticing that the sunflowers are sprouting for, you know, from where they're laying on the ground, you know, and it's 10 degrees outside, and this is an unheated hoop house. And then I have some of my salad covered in row cover, and I look underneath there, and the sunflower looks better than the kale. And so, you know, I'm out there working out the fields, and I'm, I'm seeing sprouting sunflowers from last year's crop, and they must have gone through low 20s. And so um, I'm thinking, well, how can I get rid of this milling and all this picking, you know, all at one time? And so, you know, my goal is to have the sub, sun, sun, sunflower substrate as long as I can throughout the year. So that means if I plant it sooner, I'm going to have it sooner in the summer. So, I mean, this year I planted it the last week of February, and it sprouted, and then it went through some cold time, and it still was alive, but it looked peaked. So I, it's turned out probably the third week of March is the time. And so, and, it, and they've consistently gone through 23, 24 degrees. Um, I don't know, the guys around us, the farmers, and we got advice that said don't plant until the 1st of July to get rid of the weevil. So, I mean, to me that was like huge information that I can plant it early and go through the frost. It's better than corn in that regard. Because um, the corn, we're trying to use untreated seed, so we're not even plant the corn until June, you know. So I can plant the corn, I can plant the sunflower now the third week of March, harvest it the 1st of, of July, and then put it in that, sun, that substrate hoop house which in the summer, if you keep it closed, it can get up to like 130 in there, I'm sure, and it dries within two weeks. So I'm using the sunflower by the middle of July. And um, so that, the, to me, that was like the, probably the number one thing that I learned on this, this grant. Um, so that means we're harvesting from the middle of July to about we're just finishing up now, so it's four months. And so that's where I'm getting like, it's basically coming out to be five hours a week, probably less than that even, that people are out there picking heads. So I wouldn't say it's really that bad of a job. Um, the other thing the sunflower has over corn is it's easier to pick. I mean, the, the, the sunflower head is right up there. You can see it. It's no question. You know, corn is like there were so many small misshapen ears that you'd have to like almost grab the corn and feel it. Is it one worth picking? And then you got to go whoop, you know. And so to me, corn is a lot more difficult to pick. Um, it was a lot more subjective. You had to be more, the more quality control done. Uh, one downside of the sunflower was that when it matures, it falls, it turns over, and then these big heads create this bowl, and then that isn't a problem most of the time, but two years ago, we had so much rain, and the water just set in, the, the, in that upside-down sunflower head, which is why people grow sunflowers in western Kansas and irrigate them, because really, it's a fine line. Sunflower grows in eastern Kansas, but, you know, it, you, you get a wet September, and it's, you know, <laughs> you're going to be losing a lot of, of kernel. Um, well, like I said, all this substrate ends up in the compost at one time or another. Um, all, you know, that third question that we were answering about the food grade um, crop, even though corn doesn't work as well for growing, for getting a mushroom substrate out of it, it worked a lot better for getting a food grade crop. So Connor had a lot of uh, bloody butcher seed um, for milling. He made a lot of cornmeal. Um, we made tamales. We made masa. 
Um, it really, once the corn dries down, and the, you know, maybe there was an earworm in there, maybe not, but it dries down, it's more stable, whereas the sunflower is, um, it's harder to store, and the mice, birds, you know, so there's gonna be more problems. Um, the sunflower seed, um, you know, oh great, the sunflower works, I just gotta get the seed and plant it. Oh, it's not that easy. Um, the sunflower seed comes from, uh, well, I get it by it from Johnny's Selected Seed, but they don't, they don't grow it, somebody else grows it. One time, Johnny's was back ordered on the seed, and I kind of freaked out because it was getting close to planting time. So I called the, their the CHS, the distributor, and I said, well, Johnny's is out of seed. Doesn't, don't you have some other d person that you sell it through? CHS said, we don't sell it to anybody. I said, you're selling it to Johnny's. Johnny's is selling your product to me. No, I won't admit to that. I mean, it's just such a under, I mean, it's just like, this is a private, this is such a protected seed with genetics that um, basically these companies don't let the seed out unless you agree and you sign a contract that you'll sell all the product back to them. Even Urker Grain out in Colorado, I called them and said, because I had a pretty good relationship with them, and I said, um, Joyce, why, why don't you just sell me enough seed for five acres? I'm trying to grow my own so I don't have to buy it from you anymore. Mm, can't do that. You have to all go or sign this contract so you can. So I mean, there's one seed that I found that I can use, and I've talked to a seed guy out there, and he claimed there's more people. But I called um, other seed companies, like big seed companies, and got their representative in eastern Kansas. They called me back with uh, confection seed varieties. No one called me. They would answer the phone, but they could never get back to me because. What I'm using is such an odd amount. It's like, you know, I'm, using ten, I'm buying 10,000 seeds and it's costing me $320, $25, and that's just nobody else is doing that. There's like a lot of home gardeners and there's people with hundreds of acres of sunflowers. And so I'm like stuck in the middle. So as long as Johnny's has got the seed, I'm just fine. Um, but now that I'm talking about it, I think I'll go home tonight and order some more. <laughs> I'll go home and order some more seed, just like so stick it in the fridge and have it. Um, um, there's another big advantage that the sunflower has over corn um, or, and over the milled sunflower coming from the, um, the mill in Colorado is that, you know, once you crack that sunflower and it's milled, then it's starting to, the seed is like cracked, the kernel is cracked and it's starting to go rancid, it's exposed. And if you got, and for me to get the price down, the order from Colorado, I gotta buy a whole bunch of it. So it's just sitting there for six months going rancid. So the kernel stays fresh in the head until you get ready to use it. And so it's just, it's, it's a nice, you know, nature's own little way of uh, storing, you know, the product in there. So they're just a lot more stable in the head. Um, Oh, okay, then I'm like, so I was like, I was talking about the, the cedar and um, I'll show you some of the sunflowers here. Um, the very first part of the seed gets planted with a push cedar because you know, I'm not gonna put the cedar in my tractor and plant a 16th of an acre. So what I end up doing is um, early, all the seed before June gets planted with a push cedar and they're like different part, maybe in just little parts of my vegetable garden. Um, it's more like a gorilla growing. I just see a spot. What am I gonna do with that? I wanna finish that field up, just put some sunflowers in. And so all the seed is getting put in with a push cedar until I, the main crop. And there's some pictures of our sunflower. There's a good example of a, it's kind of a constricted little field, but I didn't wouldn't do anything else with it. So I just filled it full of sunflowers. There's another picture of that field. And there, that field's not very wide. It was just part of a vegetable field. Um, there I am pounding shell with the sledgehammer. Um, there's pictures of the different, after you pound it, you have to sift it. Um, there's the chipper shredder over here on the right. There's the inside of my substrate hoop house. I got all these drying racks, so that's how I dry them. Um, just stick them on those racks and they dry pretty quick. There's a sunflower that comes through the wood chipper. Uh, there's that welter seed that Connor used. Um, it was a good variety. It made a lot of corn. It just wasn't that good for milling, for, for making cornmeal. Uh, there's the bloody butcher there, and the bloody butcher chipped. I mean, corn cob is a wonderful substrate. I'm surrounded by corn. I just know how to get the cob. <laughs> Uh, there's how we get the shell off the corn. In America, the one on the left is how we do it because it goes from that hand-cranked one to a combine in America. And the one on the right is from Alibaba because in, in China, they've got all kinds of people like me <laughs> in between, like these mid-sized growers. There's some of the varieties, corn varieties. Uh, there's the wood, the asadas pile. There's the, a picture of the shell I get from Urker Grains. Just comes in big 500-pound totes. 
I mean, after six months in the winter, you know, there's like multiple generations of baby mice being grown in these things. <laughs> um, I also do other little, this is my wood lot. I actually grow, I'm growing my own wood chips. And so um, if you know what coppicing is, like little elm trees, you can just chop them down, they grow back again. And so I just keep doing that over and over again. And trees like, tree, they make better chips if they're like in little trees like that, rather than huge big trees like from a tree trimmer. And more pictures of wood chips. Uh, there's how we do all, we soak up all the substrate in buckets with holes in them. So there's like 24 buckets at a time. There's some pictures of our mushrooms, how they grow there. And all these mushrooms are being grown on the sunflower substrate. There's the picture of my greenhouse on the other side of that mushroom building that where all the air is getting blown in. Uh, there's my light kitchen. There's my substrate lab. So I make my own spawn. Um, I keep my own cultures. Uh, there's the substrate lab there. There's the substrate lab waiting to be in, having all the blocks inoculated. Uh, there's the autoclave, so that's how the substrate gets processed. It goes into this autoclave and gets sterilized. Um, that boiler on the right-hand side, that's a 15 horsepower boiler, it will run two of those autoclaves at the same time, if I was to have to. <laughs> uh, there it is, full. And there's the incubation room where the bags are just sitting around waiting to grow through. Uh, there's one of my grow rooms. There's my grow room in Kansas City. It's a limestone mine. Um, oh, that's a whole other story. It's like um, organisms are growing there that I just couldn't get to grow anyplace else. It's 55 degrees and 70% humidity all year round. So we're able to grow shiitakes all summer and that's like huge for a farmer's market. Um, I guess that's it. Um, you know, Connor, I was Connor saying, and I know I, read, I keep thinking about that coming up here. And the problem was, is that the corn was like, you know, got weed pressure. Then there was a time he planted it with this antique cedar. And I literally, I would drive by this little corn patch and there was like eight stocks per foot. You're going to make corn like that. You know, so when he averaged, then he got some good corn. And so when you, how do you average all that in? Do you just take your good corn and, and do that? The way I got my price was I took a field, a set field. I found out the square footage. I had one guy go out there, cut all the, all the heads off and keep track of his hours. And then we found, we extrapolated out how much it costs per seed and how much it costs to plant and all those things. And then, um, then the processing and that kind of, I just kind of, you know, came up with the price. So you can see that, um, on the, um, the first year, when we were just scraping them off, it cost us 58 cents a pound. And then when I could just forget the scraping, because Michael, my friend Michael did most of this work, so he's, <laughs> he was a faithful scraper that first year. And then uh, second year, I just sent him to the, the chipper, and I was able to cut 20 cents off the price. And so then you can compare that to other things. Um, Cottonseed hole is a very good substrate. You can't get it organic, really. And um, that's we are certified organic. That's so we were trying to keep everything organic. That's why the sunflower farmer dropped out most likely because he knew he couldn't grow it organically, and there was no way you're going to get a kernel for human consumption certified organic at five. Eight, you know, just <laughs> um, the the sunflower is a, just a bug magnet, a pest magnet to me. I mean, the corn earworm the first year was so bad, um, I couldn't believe it. Well, like I said, that's a problem. And, and the oyster is one that will make multiple flushes. So how do you track it after that? You know, because we had labels on the bags the first time, and then the second time, um, you know, oh, they, some of them went that way. So, so that's, I did black poplar reason myself. So I had them in the grow room, and I had them in one, all in this, you know, each substrate kind of shelf, and then I was able to, and I just left them there, and then let them do second flush, and then weigh that too. There's a lot of like, when you're picking this stuff, you gotta have all these looking, you know, which was substrate one and two, and you're trying to keep all this together. And, and so, um, um, yeah, I think that that's probably what happened with the oyster, because you can just get multiple, multiple flushes. flushes. And my guess is that corn cob is gonna give you multiple flushes, because it's so dense and hard that it's taking a long time to break down. And so, um, but that's a whole other matter. You can go, only get second flushes during certain parts of the year when it's summer or just so many bugs. It's better just to throw them out and start over again.